Williams, we have another in our lectures in the uh, Sustainable Campus uh, LDA 190 lecture series. Uh, my name is Steve Wheeler. I'm the Landscape Architecture faculty. Um, before we start today, I have one short announcement from Jeff Lux, who, as you remember, was here the first uh, day of our series. Um, but this is about his Sustainable Cities of Northern Europe uh, field trip, field class. Next summer, it will be going from July 1st to July 31st. You will visit five countries, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, France, and Switzerland, and nine cities. Uh, and you can, those of you who are students can enroll in this for uh, four units of studio credit and eight units total. But you need to get on the ball because it will fill up very soon this, um, this month. Uh, what you should do is you should contact the study abroad office to start to enroll. Um, and then I guess you have to finish after January 4th when the web app opens. I don't know quite the process, but if you have any questions, contact Jeff. His email, I believe, is jlox at ucde.ucdates.edu. Um, extension. Extension, yes. Um, so uh, get on that ball, because it often does fill up um, right now in November, and our students then who come on this spring can get in. So uh, check it out. Um, and I will pass around the um, roster as usual. Those of you who are enrolled in the class, check your name off. Um, and I think that is all of our announcements for the day. We are very lucky today to have uh, with us um, Bob Seeger, who is Assistant Vice Chancellor for Planning. Uh, he is uh, actually has degrees in both planning and landscape architecture uh, from Stanford in Michigan. He's been in Davis though for 20 years. Uh, he has a very good job these days because he is overseeing West Village, which we will hear about. And there have been some very exciting recent developments with, with West Village. Um, and he also has just finished up a stint uh, directing the centennial celebrations. So um, he, his plate is very full. But thank you for joining us today, Bob. And I would like to Thanks very much. Um, it's great to be here. I've got two people from the centennial team back here. Adrian Crabtree and Mabel Salon, say hi. Um, that's why um, I started this by calling it the Sustainable Second Century. It's something we talked about a lot um, during the centennial celebrations over the last couple of years and a way to uh, look forward because that's really what we're trying to do in the centennial is look back at all the past accomplishments of the university but also look forward to the second century. And given the topic of this class, um, it seemed uh, especially pertinent to put up the Sustainable Second Century and you'll see as I get into some of the plans for the campus, we're trying to use that word in its broadest sense. I think often the word sustainability is applied most often to environmental best practices. But um, one of the things that we hope to do in, in our application of it is talk about that fuller definition of how societies work, how economies work, um, as well as how the environment works. So we try to look at all those aspects going forward for the campus. Um, just a, just a fun little recap on the centennial. This is are just some of the things that uh, we did over over the last year, 2008-9, was the centennial. <coughs> and um, for those of you who don't know, the, the university was founded in 1908 with uh, 18, 18 students. So um, pretty amazing story of the last 100 years uh, getting to the UC Davis of today. So I won't go through that, but it's fun to think back on that for a second. Um, so I'm going to do two things today, mostly in my talk, and then hopefully leave lots of time for questions. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, Professor Wheeler asked me to talk about plans for the central campus, where we are right now, the part of UC Davis that most people think of when uh, somebody says UC Davis. So that's about 850 acres within the freeways between Interstate 80 and Highway 113, the central campus. The campus itself, Sid England talked about it in an earlier talk. In the local Davis area, is about 5,300 acres. It's the largest UC campus <coughs> by far. Um, and I think he mentioned, too, context on that. It's just our central campus that I'm going to talk about here first. At 850 acres, is about the size of two UCLA's. So it's a really big place. And um, But I'm going to focus for today on the central campus and then on West Village and some of the sustainability initiatives that, that we've got going there. So this is just a beginning slide. Um, these little diagrams, when we put together this framework plan, uh, we, we got it approved by the regents of the university last May. 
And um, just a, briefly, the way planning works at UC Davis, there are really three or four levels to it. The first level is something we call the Long Range Development Plan. And that's where we do a plan, a land use plan for that whole 5,300 acres, looking typically about 15 or 20 years into the future to the best of our ability. So it's kind of like a city general plan. We call it a long range development plan or an LRDP. And uh, that's where we talk about the whole resource base of, of UC Davis. Then we go to the next level down in detail, which is this framework plan. Um, and that's more of an urban design and, and master plan type level for buildings and landscapes and circulation, showing how all those things are interconnected. And then the next level down is when we get to a specific project. So we'll do site plans and building plans for a specific project within this framework, which also sits within that big LRDP, that one of development plan. So I'm going to talk today about, about this framework plan. And a point about the approach to this, um, any plan like this really needs to take, in, in my view, uh, two different approaches that are Inter, but then interconnected. The first is that what we're really talking about is places on the ground for people. So there's the place-based approach. What kind of places do we create? How are they connected? What function do they provide? But then there's also all these systems behind that. So these little diagrams, for example, in the upper left, that's um, a building capacity. The one below it is the stormwater system. Uh, down the third one is the transit system. Then uh, an inventory of every tree on campus is lower left. Uh, parking and, and the main loop circulation, open space, uh, bicycle planning. This map, if you can see it, has every uh, major utility line on the campus highlighted on it. This is an integrated circulation map. Um, that's the roadway system and that's the existing condition. So it's really, at the end of the day, it's about planning places for people, for you all to enjoy and do your work and, um, and meet the functional needs of the campus. But behind it is this more kind of diagrammatic, analytical approach about the systems it takes to feed a place and make it work. So the planning um, exercise, in my view, is a matter of doing both of those. But mostly it's about rolling up these different systems into making sure we create good places for people. Um, so I just want to say a word about that. And I, what I'll do is I'll walk you through the way that this framework plan is put together. Um, I brought one copy. It's on the website. Um, you can find it right there on the website. The whole thing's on. And I'll, I'll pass this around as I'm talking just so you can get a sense of what the document's like. And again, we just completed that this um, earlier this year. So we established three principles, three goals for this framework plan. The first one is just um, the place exists so that the mission of the university can be accomplished. So teaching, research, and public service missions of the university, whatever the physical environment can do to support that, that's job number one. And, th and that's the first goal up there. Um, the second one is um, in terms of campus life. So while the primary mission of the place is teaching, research, and public service, it's also a whole community. And campus life, there, there are students that live here, there are places to eat, there are recreation amenities, there are entertainment venues, there are all the things that come with being a whole community. So that's the campus life part of it. <coughs> and then there's the environment itself with goals that we have to create a sustainable, a physical um, environment as we can. So all three of those, <coughs> when we look at creating the campus environment, um, we want to hit all those cylinders um, if we're going to be successful. So um, first thing we do in a plan like this is say, what's the existing condition? What's the context? So there are um, elements in this plan that describe the geography and climate, um, what makes this particular location different than others. And um, I'm encouraged by the Sustainable Sites Initiative that's coming out of the American Society for Landscape Architects to try to set up a rating system that's more bioregionally based then um, the LEED system, if you're familiar with that, the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, which is the U.S. Green Building Council's rating system. But it works a lot better for buildings than it does for places. It's not very tuned. Um, so you might get the same point for saving a drop of water on the East Coast that you get for saving a drop of water on the West Coast, and those are kind of different um, in terms of impact. So this Sustainable Sites Initiative, I think, will really help us fine tune um, sustainable development from a from more of a landscape and site-based perspective. So we inventory geography and climate. Um, we take stock of the development history of the campus. This little diagram I've got there is a plan that was done in the 1920s uh, for the UC Davis campus. And just to orient you, 
Um, today's quad is like that. And uh, so the union's right here. So this, here's the, the way you got into UC Davis from the north, Howard Way coming in, because the state highway was Russell Boulevard, uh, going through this part of the valley. So you came in from the north. And then they envisioned this um, double size central space. Now remember, this is when the quad was still a farm field. Um, so there's great old photos of the quad as a farm field. And um, you won't, in this plan, you won't see any um, existing buildings on there. So North Hall, South Hall, those were all temporary buildings. Um, you know, dorms that were put up really fast to get the campus started. So this, those are right here. You know, 1920s, they said, well, that'll be replaced by a big institutional building. So anyway, it's really fun to look back at, at, at some of these things. So we, we, we took inventory of the development history and then laid out some of our challenges and opportunities going forward. And, and a lot of that for us at this point in the university's development is about um, intensifying the central campus development. So um, even though we've got this 850 acres, the central campus where the academic um, and instruction, the instruction research part of the campus is, is about 250. And that's big enough because if it gets much bigger than that, um, then the kind of interaction that we want to keep between disciplines and between students and faculty and from one um, disciplinary area of the campus to another, that starts to erode if that gets too big. So even though we have more land in the central campus than that, we want to keep the academic part of the campus compact. So a lot of what happens is laid out in this plan is, is infill development, compact development, intensification, taking out low-rise buildings and surface parking lots and putting in larger buildings and new open spaces um, to create a more compact uh, campus. And it's actually one advantage we have that we've been able to do over the years. Um, and it is that package, if you take out a parking lot or a low-rise building, but you can put back a taller building and a great open space that people can use for a gathering area among several buildings, then it works. If you just put the buildings side by side, there, there would be an urban character to this that I don't think would be in keeping with the heritage of UC Davis, but it, I think we can do both successfully. So this, um, that's kind of a fun aerial photo, um, pretty recent of the campus, although, yeah, I guess it is, because it's got the, you can see the Madabi Institute for Hawaiian Food Science and the layout of the new vineyard um, right there along Old Davis Road. And that vineyard, by the way, is a, is a teaching vineyard for the Department of Viticulture and Enology. So it actually, um, it's, it's 10 one-acre um, plots of grapevines. And what they do is they have students in that discipline plant an acre, and then um, on a 10-year cycle, they can see the growth and development of the grapevines from years one through nine, and then they take out the 10th year of uh, grapevines and start over. So there'll always be one acre that's turning over there because it's it's not a um, you know it's not intended to get 60-year-old vines. It's intended to be a teaching resource that um, that's for students and faculty. So in putting this framework plan together, we laid out five um, organizing ideas for the central campus. And I'll, I'll go through each one of those on this sheet and then each one in a little more detail and then talk about West Village a bit. So um, what we tried really hard to do on these five organizing ideas is integrate sustainability values, planning concepts, and architectural and landscape guidelines. So instead of Maybe the more traditional, here's the sustainability chapter that says do good, and then here's the plan for the campus, and then here's architectural guidelines. We tried to integrate all of them um, into these planning concepts. So each, um, I'll go through the five framework areas, and then in detail I'll show you what the sustainability value was that we were working towards. And again, you'll see it's a very broad definition of, uh, of what we mean by sustainability, and then um, how, how they all work together. So the first one, we called um, strengthen the civic core of the campus. And I'll, I'll tell you more about that, but that's, that's a north-south organizing idea from, from the very north edge of campus on Howard Way where you're coming off Russell, all the way down past the Union, the Quad, the Library, the Arboretum, all the way down to the Madavi Center area. That's a north-south organizing idea, and we called it the civic core, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the second one is an east-west organizing idea, and it's basically along the corridor of Hutchison Drive, and that's unique on our campus because of the transit nature of that street. So looking forward and thinking about a sustainable plan, um, the fact that we've created this transit street that goes right through the middle of what would otherwise be a completely closed to vehicles campus is a big move towards sustainable transportation. 
So we call that the bus bike boulevard. So we've got a north-south idea, an east-west idea, and then here's the Arboretum, which is this naturalized landscape along the old creek bed um, along which the campus was founded. And that's kind of the third big organizing idea for the campus. So connecting the fabric of the central campus to the Arboretum itself and making that a part of daily life on the campus. So if you look at those three, then in between um, are all these neighborhoods. So there's an academic neighborhood there, there's one there, there's one on the east side, and over here. So with these three big framework ideas that organize the whole campus, north, south, east, west, and then that natural landscape of the Arboretum, um, within that framework sit these different neighborhoods. And that's the way we think about the campus, that they're academic neighborhoods, residential neighborhoods, and they all tie to these, um, what is the civic and social heart of the campus, what is the transportation heart of the campus, and the landscape base of the campus. So it's a, it's, a, it's a different way of thinking about how the campus goes together. And then the last one is, that, is how we connect to the outside world. So at all these different entry points around the central campus, they're really different. This one's on the Davis community edge. That one's the old historic entrance from the north. There's a freeway entrance there and another one down here um, off the Interstate 80 entrance. So different functions for how we connect to um, the local community and the regional community <coughs> with this fabric inside the campus. So to go to each one of those in a little more detail, um, civic is not a word that you typically hear um, on a campus. You tend to think of city um, spaces when you hear that word. But the reason we chose that is because I think one of the unique things about the Davis campus is the nature of this community and the incredibly high degree of participation of students and faculty and staff um, in the way this place runs and in the daily life of this place. So that, that notion of civic life, um, I think we have that in a very strong way on the Davis campus. If you're going to do that, you need to create places to make that happen. Or at least in our case, preserve places where that does happen. The kind of public activity that happens on the quad um, is really rare and wonderful. Um, and so we want to preserve that, and we, we want to create other spaces like that for public life. In my view, um, you can't have a sustainable community unless people participate in it, care enough about it, to work for it. Um, so that's what we meant by strengthening the civic core of the campus. If we can support that by the way we design and build and plan the place, then um, we think we're doing our job. So for that concept, that's the diagram that's in the report. And again, it's a little bit different way of thinking about tying the campus together, all the way from the historic entrance on the upper left, which is north, past <coughs> the Union and the Quad, and then taking those um, cork oak lined streets of the Quad and imagining bringing those all the way down and locking in to the new regional entrance from the south at the Mondavi Center. And the kind of spaces that get reimagined as you do that, I mean, right now the patio in front of the library blocks that. Um, you can't see that this happens to be a cork oak line um, pedestrian mall over there, and then you've got cork oaks lining West Quad, but the way that library patio was designed, you can't tell. So we think we can buy um, kind of some um, you know, strategic um, surgery uh, <laughs> in here, come in and create these connecting places that make the campus feel much more whole, much more connected, um, and the connections to these civic places, which in my mind are the quad and this big section of the Arboretum, I mean, you think of the Battle of the Bands on picnic day, and then this civic space down here, which is much more oriented to the external community. So connecting those places where public life happens um, on the Davis campus through this framework. And then um, we go to the next step, and I only give you one example, but um, in each of these areas, so we identify the sustainability value, the big planning construct, that ties it all together. And the dark buildings are potential um, either redevelopment or new building footprints. So this integrates a lot of those little diagrams that you saw in that first slide. It integrates where buildings go, where pathways and bikeways and roadways go, how new open spaces integrate. When you break all those things apart into layers in a plan, it just kind of, you can do it, but it stops making sense as a place. So this is an attempt to integrate all that back. Those little diagrams kind of take it all apart again and show one idea at a time. So what's the bike network look like? And that intersects this whole thing. So it's back and forth. Um, and then in each area like this, we said, what's unique about the civic core? Well, it's got these big civic buildings. It's got 
unions, libraries, performing arts centers, those are different kinds of buildings than um, an academic building like this one, than a recreation building, than housing. So what <coughs> relationships should those big public buildings have to open space and circulation? And so we actually lay out in each area, I don't have examples, but we lay out in each area what kind of architectural guidelines does it take for those buildings to help support this idea. And as a landscape architect, I have to tell you, it's great fun to do a plan where we're describing how buildings support the landscape-based idea rather than what typically might happen, which is <laughs> the building drives the design process and, and too often landscape architects come in late. So creating this big framework, this land-based, landscape-based, buildings have a role, that was fun. Okay? Um, but it, I mean, it's more than fun. It's how we make the place. And buildings have a job to do in addition to what's inside, they have a job to do outside to create these good public spaces. So that's idea number one. Number two was amplify the, the bus bike boulevard. So that's our east-west physical organizing idea. And of course, sustainability value there is clean transportation. Um, the Unitrans system is really, I happen to pick a picture of probably what is not a clean, uh, that's probably still a, no, a diesel bus, unless they, is it still a diesel bus? Yeah. But most of them are, are compressed natural gas buses. <coughs> they even got the hydrogen um, fuel that they test. And then the bicycle circles right there. So um, that idea, in addition to that value, provides east-west organization for transportation on the campus. And this is the diagram in more detail. So um, here's an idea that um, you may not have seen before. So the, the first one I showed you, the north-south, that came right through Shields Library in the north-south direction. So um, left to right on the page. Now look at the front of Shields Library in an east-west direction on this transportation spine. And there are a couple of new spaces on here that we're imagining in the plan. So this new um, transportation hub, this Unitrans terminal has just been completed in the last year or so. Well, that is probably now the single biggest generator of pedestrian activity on the campus, because that's where all the buses let out, right? So that's where you all start walking after you get off the bus. So what happens when you go both directions from there? It's kind of a mess, um, right? I mean, it's, uh, there's a bunch of temporary buildings up there where it says uh, street front building on a pedestrian promenade, and then you go this way, and there's a bunch of temporary buildings, and cars and buses and bikes and people pushing lab carts across the street. And <laughs> it's crazy. So this shows two new spaces, public spaces, on either side of that transportation hub. The one on top, there where it says the Walker Promenade, where actually um, the building where it says street front building on a pedestrian promenade, that building is in design. It's called the Student Community Center. It was funded with a student referendum a couple of years ago. And so those, it is true, those temporary buildings on that corner are sh short for this world. Um, been here how long? 35 years or something, so very temporary. <laughs> um, but they're gone. We call them historic. They're historic, yeah. They, if they were 45, we'd have to do a National Register investigation. <laughs> they aren't. Nothing. So um, there's a new building going there, and then there's Walker Hall. The concept is opening up the entire middle of that block with a pedestrian promenade, a pedestrian walk, that from the front door of Shields Library will connect you right through that block over to the silo hub and to the silo. And that will change the way the whole middle of campus feels. Um, it'll be a very active street. There'll be student activities in those buildings. Um, so it's a very exciting prospect, and we're doing the first building. Um, and then one more project, and Walker Hall uh, won't have anybody in it anymore, and then we have to figure out a way to renovate that and change the back of it so we can create this connector between, I mean, when the library was built, the front door faced the quad, right? It makes perfect sense. But then it got added onto three times, and each time the door changed. So the last time it landed, they had to, you know, they closed it on the fourth side, and that's where the door ended up, um, on the west side. But this is going to rationalize all that and, and connect to the west side of campus. So that's exciting. And then this idea, um, if you were to go there right now, um, that building that uh, has the space frame, that's right here. Okay, and then there's a building that sits right here. That's a little one-story green metal building. So this reimagines um, extending buildings connected to the silo complex over this point, and then that goes away. There's big redwood trees in here, um, and new building footprints. Something that um, would take this part of campus, which is where the, the um, physical sciences and engineering disciplines are, and 
this part of campus where biological sciences and um, agriculture are, and connecting those two with a new common quad on that side of campus. Because you know not everybody can have frontage on the main quad anymore. So it needs a new, we need a new space of activity like that, but we want it connected back with strong pedestrian ways back to that north south <coughs> civic core itself. So this is a really um, interesting potential for this part of campus. It'll take a while, but um, I guess I've been around long enough now um, working on things like this to feel like they will, they'll happen if they're strong enough ideas. And we'll, we'll find the opportunities to make things like this happen. So that's idea number two. Number three is to connect to the Arboretum. And Arboretum is a wonderful opportunity because it's, a, it's an environment where the landscape is dominant um, to try different things and, and different kinds of design. So the value that we put there was integrating the built environment and natural environment. Of course, we try to do that whenever we can with um, the way we design buildings, but it's different when you're in a dominant landscape environment. <coughs> this is an idea um, to get you oriented. Um, Interstate 80 is down here. And this is Old Davis Road. Right now you come down to Old Davis Road on the campus and it curves this way. So this is an idea where you actually come this way and you could take a left and get to a visitor center here for the Arboretum. And um, this is where horses are grazing right now. Um, as a part of the large animal facility that's right over here. Um, so what it does is it takes this part of the Arboretum, which has these wonderful assets of the gazebo and the, the new nursery, and um, expands the Arboretum to the north and provides access to it from the south. So what happens is, I wish we could take a walk out there because it's really fun. You go to this part of campus, you, if you come in this way, there's just an oleander hedge right here, but it's a completely different world. And you know what it takes to get to um, Hooter Creek Lodge, right? I mean, you have to, I mean, you can't get there from here. <laughs> you go up here and up and left and left again and along the old um, wastewater treatment plant and find the parking lot, hopefully. Well, this, um, this whole landscape here is just on the other side of that hedge. So um, it can, we can turn this end of the Arboretum into a phenomenal um, public resource with access, and that's the end of the Arboretum where we have the land base to really um, demonstrate and pilot sustainable based land practices for UC Davis. So it's a really exciting prospect working with academic units to um, help decide what that landscape and what those buildings should look like. So that's number three. Um, number four is I mentioned, so those if you think of those as the big three framework ideas, and then those neighborhoods, I just picked one to illustrate but there are a whole variety of campus neighborhoods, and they have different degrees of connection to, this, to these three framework ideas. This is the one where the physical sciences and engineering are. Um, the principle there being compact land use, I mentioned that at the beginning, so we don't necessarily want these academic regions to grow. We want to keep people close to each other for the kind of interaction that it takes to really be successful and to conserve land. So this is um, that part of campus to get you oriented again. This building just got completed. Um, this is the new uh, Earth and Physical Sciences building, the Arboretum's right here. So this has um, physics and chemistry teaching labs in it, and the geology department is in this end of the building. The master plan, there's the water tower that you can see from I-80. The master plan for this part of campus, this is where the um, facility service yard is, um, and where um, all the, um, the shops are, and the storehouses, and that kind of thing. So gradually those will move out and we've got space for two more academic buildings to create this new campus green that um, collects these three buildings together and faces the Arboretum. And then this is an area over, um, this is um, civil and environmental engineering, that's Boehner Hall, and that site has um, a temporary building and, a, and, the old, um, and an old one-story building on it. And that part of campus, I think, is kind of the toughest neighborhood in a way because all the buildings are facing different directions and there's no sense of common um, gathering space or identity for that part of campus. A lot of the other parts have these nice green gathering spaces, that part doesn't. So that's the one opportunity where it says district center um, where at least three of those four corners, um, Boehner Hall, there's, I, there's nothing you can do. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, those big wings of Vayner Hall are big research wings and their back doors and that, you know, when that was built, that was the that was the extent of the campus. It was like, we'll never need to do anything on that side. Mm -hmm. Everything's over here. That's the back door. Don't don't worry about it. Well, that never happens. Um, but at least this building has a front door there. Um, Kemper Hall has a, has a door at that end. And we can redevelop that site to have front doors on what we're calling the district center and create a sense of identity and gathering. Um, and again, that's taking um, a, a small parking lot and, and small temporary buildings and intensifying the building development but bringing a good open space along with it. So that's number four. Um, number five is uh, the, the connection to, to the rest of society, that the university is not an island in its own right. So when you think about sustainability, if we're just over here doing our thing, um, academically and otherwise, and it doesn't um, make a difference to um, the rest of the world, um, our sustainable prospects are not too good. Um, so we want to express that in the physical design of the campus too. We want to connect, we want to welcome people in. Um, this whole development around where the Madavi Center and all that, if you, if you look at those things, those are all um, uses that have a pretty high degree of public attraction. There's the Madavi Center Performing Arts Center, New Graduate School of Management, which has regional business connections, Alumni Visitor Center, it's Mondavi Institute for Wine and Food Science, people pretty into wine and food. Um, so there are things now where you used to just drive by and see the water tower, now there are activities there that the public can come engage in, find out more about UC Davis. That is part of the sustainability plan, folks. If we don't connect to the outside world and gain support and ownership, and if people don't think what we're doing is valuable, then resources will just continue to, to shrink. So we can actually design and plan the campus to support um, those big university goals. Uh, and that's just a diagram of the different kinds of entry opportunities that um, we have as you, as you march around central campus. So this is one example. Um, I picked the Walker Promenade area, but where we diagram in the document, when you do a building in these important public places, what role the building should play um, with regard to those public places. And then it also goes and, and starts to identify certain architectural guidelines. I just excerpted some of the shading strategies that I think you've started to see more frequently in the new buildings around campus that for a long time didn't happen at all. Pretty simple stuff, but um, an architectural style can grow. Even though um, I'm not the campus architect and um, the architecture on campus is, to be polite, diverse. Um, you know, we, Clayton Holiday is the campus architect, and through measures like this, um, of, of saying there, there are common elements that can tie old buildings and new buildings together if they make sense for the climate, um, if they make sense for the place, and so we can build a vocabulary and identity for UC Davis architecture by starting with the climate and building. <coughs> so you'll see a lot of new buildings um, and retrofits to old buildings taking on this kind of character. So um, that's an overview of the, of the Central Campus Framework Plan. How are we doing on time? We have about 17 minutes. So. So, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a quick run through West Village and try to leave about 10 minutes. Um, for questions at the end, because West Village is a really big initiative. I know others have talked about it in this class, um, but I'll just give you an overview. And, and from my perspective, what's particularly interesting about it from a, a planning and, and design uh, perspective as, as we go forward. So um, it's a new neighborhood for students, faculty, and staff on the campus, immediately west of 113. Um, the reason we're doing it is basically to build a stronger UC Davis community. So, Chancellor looked, um, we, when we started our long-range plan back in the year 2001, um, looked ahead 15 years and said, look, City of Davis is not building um, hardly at all. We're going to continue to grow. And if we don't provide housing for students, faculty, and staff, then really the, the distinctive character that the Davis community has for UC Davis um, as a college town is going to begin to erode. And we're going to turn into more of a, com a commuter uh, community, and we should do something about it. So we, West Village is the response to that. If you um, live there, you're going to have some connection to UC Davis. Either you go to school there, here, or you work here. Um, we're pledging that we'll make the um, for sale units for faculty and staff um, below market. That's gotten harder as the market's gone below. Um, but that's the pledge. And um, we also it also includes a partnership with the Los Rios Community College District. District we're building the first community college on a UC Davis on a UC campus in West Village at the Village Square. 
and then um, I want to mention the environmental planning and design and what we're trying to do to take a leadership role there. So the phase that's under construction right now um, comprises 130 acres, and you can see what's in it, um, almost 350 units of faculty staff housing, housing for almost 2,000 students, and then around the village square, I'll show you an image, 45,000 square feet of mixed use. So we're trying to create a, a real community center, um, a small mixed use center that will be the heart of this community um, with conveniences that can save people trips um, and a sense of identity, just like these open spaces on the campus provide a sense of identity. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a full, it's a small community of, with all the moving parts. Um, this is the way it lays out. So 113 is, is right here. And um, here's Hutchison Drive. And the part that's um, <coughs> under construction um, starts right here, right now. So the Village Square is the heart of it, and that's a, this is an image of it. It'll have four-story um, buildings that have three stories of, of uh, student rentals, apartments above, and a mixed-use ground floor that we hope we can... The bookstore is talking about doing a bookstore cafe annex out at West Village. And then we want to try and put as much um, other um, attractions on the first floor so that we can build a strong, vital community. The community <coughs> college is on this corner, so we talked to the community college and said, don't build you know, a small food service inside the community college. Push it out to the village square so everybody in the community can, can, can take advantage of it and it can help make things happen. The um, developer of the student housing uh, would do a fitness center inside their building. We said, no, push it out to the village square. So anything that might be a commons, just like these kind of civic parts of the campus I was talking about, it's, it's a little bit of the same idea out here, but more of a town planning model. Um, so that's the village square, and you can see it on the map, it's a green area, it's about three quarters of an acre, it's a nice big open space. Um, the landscape design um, is actually really interesting, it's got a, um, just a simple um, lawn gathering area that, that slopes very gently down, this area is high and steps down, and there's a natural drainage feature um, landscape right there that both of these landscapes drain to, so it's a more of an urban application for some of the stormwater cleansing type of landscapes that um, more and more we need to do on the campus. So that's, that's the village square. Um, there's also student housing, um, and it built out almost um, for almost 2,000 students, and that's on this, that whole part of the, of the neighborhood, and then um, back in staff housing up there. So the village square, again, is this place where hopefully um, everything comes together, and there are services and, and amenities for everybody. And then there's a whole open space network. Um, it's a whole natural drainage system on the site so that um, it's all gravity drained. The, the, the only kind of weird thing is that um, the creek is down below, but the natural grade is, goes that way. So <laughs> is it, I grew up in the Midwest where water flows downhill. <laughs> that doesn't happen here. Um, the way it works here, is we're on this plane that's, that's gradually drains from um, the coast range to the Sacramento River. And then here comes this creek and cuts through it west to east. And when that creek floods, the banks get high. Okay, so the high points are right next to the creek. So when a drop of water happens just on the other side of that levee, it never makes it to the creek. It kind of drains alongside the creek towards the Sacramento River. So, yeah. So the creek's down there and the water is kind of going northeast and southeast from the creek. So we did natural drainage with the flow, which, which ends up with all the water up at the top. In fact, if any of you went by after that first rain, there were kids swimming in it. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, a guy in my office, Carl Moore, went by and, and saw there were kids swimming in it, but he just went like this and he was afraid it was his kids. <laughs> um, so it works, but then, um, and, it, and it will hold up to you know, a 100 year storm, but then we needed an overflow because you've always got to have some kind of overflows. So there is an underground piping system that takes it back to the old north fork of the creek, which is right down here. But we were able to do the whole thing without upsizing any of the campus drainage system by using the greenways and the new ponds and, and all that to handle the drainage. And then you know all the, all the streets and the pads are all graded to make that work. Um, I'll say more about the energy initiative in a second because um, we're on a path to make West Village um, a zero net energy community, which is very exciting. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how we're doing that. Um, but first, it was to do everything that's free. So just some smart site planning. We're long east-west streets so that all the units can have southern exposure. 
and control solar access and keep narrow openings on the east and west of buildings. Um, if you have sun exposure in our climate, that also exposes you to the cooling breezes from the south. You look at the typical zigzag suburban neighborhood and the houses face every possible direction. This is simple, it's free. Just orient the street and the building and the building and take advantage of the sun and the wind. Um, we, I talked about the water system a little bit, um, the transportation system. Um, Unitrans, when we were doing the planning, said if we kept everybody within a five minute walk of the central um, bus spine, that they could have a bus out there every eight minutes or so, just shuttling back and forth to the central campus. So the bus <coughs> would come over here, up to the village square, out here and back, and everybody's within a five minute walk. So if you live at West Village, you don't, um, you don't get to buy a monthly parking permit. You can walk or bike or take the bus because otherwise we'll be providing a parking space there and over here. So um, that's part of the idea. And, um, and I mentioned some of the solar access and cooling breezes. So, so just some you know, kind of easy stuff on the, well it wasn't easy, but um, <laughs> you know, sensible stuff on the, on the site planning. And then for the energy strategy, um, working with our own energy efficiency center on campus, um, we've got a whole very, very aggressive um, package of energy efficiency measures that we're building into all the buildings, um, reducing by almost 60% energy demand of a building before anything else happens. So the first part, um, we're actually working with a group from Chevron Energy Solutions that's putting together this plan for the developer. Um, most of all of West Village, apart from a couple of utilities, is all being done in partnership with a private developer. So it's been a very interesting and complex process. But um, somebody from Chevron Energy says, and that's the renewable part of, of Chevron's um, operation, the guy with the really annoying voice that you hear on TV, you know, again and again and again. Um, that's kind of about Chevron Energy Solutions. Um, says that a megawatt is um, uh, better than a megawatt. So the megawatt is, is the energy you don't use. So real aggressive energy efficiency. And then the, the key is to produce as much renewable power on site as we use. So if we reduce the business as usual demand for the neighborhood, I think it was 23 million kilowatt hours goes down to nine through energy efficiency, nine and a half. And then by a very aggressive um, solar photovoltaic program and a, and a biodigester that's fed by organic waste <coughs> from the residence halls, uh, the dairy, and green waste on campus, from those two sources, we can create enough on-site local renewable power to match the energy, the reduced energy demand of West Village. So it's really exciting. Um, We've, um, this is just, I won't go into it, but it's a low profile that shows when, um, in the summer, when, when you need the most energy, we're actually in the best shape of producing the most. Um, and the building blocks are energy efficiency first, um, then the solar photovoltaics up to five megawatts. So as a planner, one of the most interesting things about this to me is that if this was a single-use neighborhood, let's say it was just an apartment neighborhood or just a, a single-family neighborhood, <coughs> you don't have the same toolkit um, that you have when it's an integrated mixed-use neighborhood. So the solar, the, the um, photovoltaics are going to cover every parking lot and a significant amount of the common spaces at West Village. If it's just, if it's a single-family neighborhood, you don't have parking lots. So everybody's got to try and do one on their rooftop. And what you do when you do it on your rooftop is you size them about half of what you need because you don't want to overproduce. Here, we can size it for the full demand of the community because what we don't use goes back over to the campus or back to the to the grid. So the mix as a planner, <coughs> uh, you know, the kind of mixed use new urbanist community with where you can walk to amenities and it's got good transport. That, we all know that. But now what I've learned from this is there's another reason to do a mixed use community and that's energy. Because now you start looking at energy sources and uses of one thing next to another thing. If they're you know we're leveraging the dining hall, um, the, the organic waste from the dining halls to actually turn it into an energy commodity at West Village by creating customers because people live next door. So there's all these scale opportunities from an appliance to a building to a community to the community plus the campus. And we and that's our toolkit and that's why we're able to do it. Community Energy Park is where the biodigester is and then um, something happened in the slide but it, it's all tied together with what's called a, a smart a smart grid that it allows you to measure and monitor how you use energy. So um, almost done. We got a um, $2 million grant from the California Energy Commission 
um, in July to help us with the extraordinary engineering costs that it's going to take to make West Village happen. And then we've got these monster grants in um, with the help of our Energy Efficiency Center to the Department of Energy right now and also working with um, PG&E. So the key to this whole thing is um, partnerships of all kinds. There's no way we could pull something like this off by ourselves. So it's a partnership with a private developer to start with. We've got the education partnerships with our local community college and, and school district. On the energy side, um, talented people from Chevron Energy, the Energy Commission, DOE is paying for part of the um, analysis. And then on the academic side, tremendous opportunities to think of West Village as a living laboratory for the academic side of, of UC Davis. And we have all these partners we're working with already. So it's under construction. First occupancy is fall of 11, and that's it. Okay. okay. We've got about five minutes for a few questions. Yes. Bob, can you touch on the um, Garden Path Network, um, what it is and what's, what the status is with it right now? Yeah, so um, in, our, in that central campus planning framework, there's, the, there's an idea in there um, called the, the Garden Path, and um, it's actually grown into a much more robust idea with the Arboretum, and we're calling the Gateways Project. And the idea there is that um, along the Arboretum, if you take a walk along the Arboretum, it passes all these different academic buildings, but you have no idea what's going on inside. Um, so the idea is where the Arboretum intersects um, an academic part of the campus, that we do a garden that expresses what's going on inside. And the latest one is right where that geology building where I showed you. Um, on the east side of that, there's, a, there's actually a temporary landscape there now that includes some big uh, rock samples, but we've done um, a design uh, with a landscape architect named Ron Let's Go, who's a Davis grad, um, for a geology garden, working with the faculty, and we asked the faculty, what do you want to bring out into the landscape from, to tell people about geology? And it turned into a, a walkway that's 250 feet long that will demonstrate 300 million years of ge geological history in these different outdoor rooms with sections through California showing the Central Valley emerging from an inland sea and all kinds of really cool stuff. That becomes that place where the Arboretum intersects that new garden is where these garden walks start and carry off into the, the basic open space framework of the campus. So we're trying to use these new gardens as connected places between the open space fabric of the central campus and the Arboretum itself. So thanks. Bob, what's the deal with the developers over there? What's the, what, are they getting a ground lease and you know, what kind of, what's, why, why would I do that with you if I was a developer? Yeah, yeah, they're asking themselves the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the way it works is the developer leases the ground from the university. The university retains ownership of the ground in all cases, and the developer will build, own, and manage the student apartments, and then they will work with uh, builders to build and then sell faculty staff homes. So they had to do their analysis that said at um, the acceptable rent and selling prices that they think they can make a buck on it. And um, I think they're hoping now to um, at least get out whole, <laughs> yeah. um, because yeah, it's gotten so tough with you know the current market. But um, there is you know less than half percent student vacancy uh, rate in this town, so it's really tight, and everybody's paying the price for that. So this will help on that. And what will happen first is student apartments will come up first, and they'll probably build model homes and pre-sell and not get ahead of themselves. On, on, on the homes. The Los Rios project is funded. That's going to happen. Um, and then, you know, then if you if you factored into all that, the service of paying for all the services is a really complex analysis, but that'll be factored in the home prices and the rent to pay for, you know, making the roads happen and the utilities happen just the way it would in the city, except the campus is in that, in, in the map. But um, so far, so good. Your, your financing is still good, and you're paying in. And they're great. They're incredible. I mean, they're, they're as motivated, if not more, than we are on this whole energy strategy because they, they want this to be their business. They want to be a pioneer in zero net energy. <coughs> so it's, it's, it's fantastic. Okay, maybe one or two more questions. 
Yeah. I have a question. Um, one thing I've noticed, you know, the apartment complexes near campus, they're relatively expensive for students. You know, you're cramming two people in a bedroom that's $800. I mean, is West Village going to be around the same price as the other apartment complexes? I think it's going to be a real mix. I think there are going to be some where they size a bedroom big enough to charge more and have two in, and then others where the, um, the, the units are, are smaller and not intended for doubling, and those will be less expensive. So it's going to be a mix. I noticed uh, the LaRue La entrance was not one of the, the primary gateways. Is that intentional or? Uh, no, it should have been on there. Okay. I, should, I should have had it on there because it's, um, yeah, because it's, you know, it's it's the portal for all the athletic facilities and all the public mm -hmm. access on that side. So yeah, I should have correct that. Thank you. Okay. Any final quick question? We got Bob here. Thanks. Okay, let's get to the